Have you ever gone through a really dark season? Most of us do at a certain point in our life, whether it's from loss or depression, or we go through a chemical imbalance or uh, a crisis of some kind, and uh, it throws us into a dark pit for a while, or actually we may struggle with that from then on. Uh, that's why I'm so glad that we're, we're doing this biblical uh, study for the next five weeks on uh, mental and spiritual health as it comes together with emotional health. Uh, and I, I wish that we'd been doing this 20 years ago, back when I needed it so desperately. Um, I remember, well, 2001, Cornerstone was going great. Uh, we were, what would we be, about eight years old as a Bible study that had become a large church. And the workload, though, was burying the pastors. Uh, there just weren't enough of us that had been trained in biblical counseling uh, to help people work through issues. and. Uh, not to mention just discipleship. And so it was exhausting. I know there were weeks where I just worked straight through and didn't take care of myself, um, didn't take a day off. And so, you know, what happens to guys with the, you know, overachieving Messiah complex, you know, that's what happened to me. And uh, the first thing to go is my physical health. And I contracted a disease known as sarcoidosis that uh, put me in bed for uh, months on end. Uh, took them a while to diagnose it. And before they had figured out what it was, uh, it was attacking uh, my soft tissue organs and also my brain and my nervous system. So then that threw me into a chemical imbalance as well as just the fear. I mean, they were throwing around words like lymphoma and different things. And by the time that I was diagnosed, I was so emotionally afraid that I, I broke uh, mentally emotionally and it was it was tough uh, I fell into an intense season of panic anxiety paranoia and dark dark depression and unfortunately I was sorely prepared for these mental battles with their chemical as well as subconscious social triggers I over spiritualized everything I was embarrassed uh, thinking that a Christian leader just shouldn't have these kind of struggles um, the depression was worst at night. Sometimes the nights were so long as the emotional, mental pain far uh, overshadowed the physical pain. And then during the day, recurring panic attacks would paralyze me with fear. Looking back, I thank God for, of course, family, uh, but also for uh, doctors, Christian and otherwise, for psychiatrists, Christian and otherwise, folks who knew that my symptoms were very common, very treatable, uh, both in group therapy and with medication. And I also thank God for my Christian friends who had been through some of these things. I had a good Christian friend that was a psychotherapist in the Central Valley, and he just came over and hung out with me. And more than anything he told me to do for myself, he just told me his own story. And he totally normalized what I was going through as a Christian and kind of brought it out of the spiritual realm and into into more of the, the realm of... Uh, chemicals and serotonin and things being released and dopamine and all kinds of stuff. And just that I had mentally, emotionally exhausted myself and now I needed uh, to heal. And these kind of things, it was really good for me because there was some shame attached to my illness that I don't think, I think people in the church uh, that have grown up around church, I think we kind of make this more of a spiritual issue than, than, uh, than it is. And so I, I was, I was really relieved when my Christian friends just, and the other thing is they didn't, uh, these, these people seemed to know, the ones that had been through it, seemed to know not to hit me with a bunch of positivity and Hallmark scripture cards. Uh, but there were some scriptures that I did latch onto and hang onto that are still precious to me uh, uh, to this day. So before we open today's topic, which is the topic of addiction, uh, I want to uh, give you one of my, Psalms that, that during that season, Psalm 34 became so rich to me. It was a Psalm of David when he had gone through a crazy time. And you can, you can read about that. Um, King Abimelech and all that went there. I, we won't have time for that right now, but uh, suffice it to say that David had a brush with death and insanity during that season. And after that, he wrote Psalm 34. So let me, let me just read you a few of the phrases and nuggets that uh, I learned to hang on to as I would meditate during this season and nuggets like this became 
my mantra uh, as I would breathe in and breathe out and get oxygen into my system. I also would breathe in the power of God and this, the word of God. So here's some of Psalm 34, let it minister to you. David writes, let all who are helpless take heart. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened saving me from all my troubles. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, rescuing those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles but the Lord comes to the rescue every time. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. All right, let me pray for you. Father, as we enter into this time of exploring mental and spiritual health, we're asking you to be present as we share openly about these things. Bring help and healing to everyone who joins us. Be with us as we enter into this atmosphere of honest trust. Bring comfort and healing. And everyone said, Amen. Hey everyone, I'm so glad you chose to join us for our new series on mental health. Uh, these conversations that, that we're going to be having over the, the coming weeks are so important and relevant to all of us in some way, shape, or form. Uh, most of us are experiencing or walking through some of what we'll be discussing, and, and I'm sure all of us know someone who's experiencing or has experienced addiction, grief, codependency, anxiety, or depression. So it's, it's important for us as a church to walk through this together. And not just because of those experiences, but also because we are the church. I mean, we, we read very clearly in scripture that when one of us is hurting, all of us hurt. We, we are a body. I and mean, here's what Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. If one part suffers every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And, and to use this analogy from scripture, if, if I have a cut on my finger or a broken bone in my leg or an ailment somewhere in my body, then the rest of my body is very aware and affected by that hurt. Secondly, when we exist in this body and we are hurting, we're all involved, all of us are involved in the healing process for the part of the body that is, that is hurting. We are a healing body. That's what the church is. So it's important for us to, to provide and organize and create space for people to heal. Now, let me be very clear about something. One sermon or one conversation on a weekend or, or whenever you may be watching what we'll be saying today is not intended to be the solution. This is the beginning of the conversation, as, as any church gathering is. We hope through, through these conversations and through these weekends to open the door to healing for, for some people and to create a space for continued, continued healing for others. This is also why it's important for us to hear more voices than one pastor or church leader. So with that, I'd like to introduce to you our care director, licensed therapist, and cornerstone expert on all that we'll be discussing throughout this series, Amy Sargent. Amy, thank you for joining me and, and thank you for for teaching me and discipling me in the areas that we've been discussing and are going to be discussing as a church. I think it's so important 
for us as a church family to be walking through this. And I'm so, so, so grateful that you are helping guide and lead us through this, this process. So with that said, is there anything you'd like to add to what I said just a moment ago? Sure. Well, thanks, Steve, for letting me come and be part of that conversation. Uh, as you know, I'm a strong advocate for mental health issues and very passionate about even protecting the people that have them. And the reason why I say that is because sometimes churches don't do that well. And I say that um, not necessarily uh, to condemn anybody here, but I really want to let you know that sometimes what has happened is when people open up about the experiences that they've been going through, it ends up Get, they end up getting wrong messages. They end up getting messages that are saying, you don't have enough faith, or you have done something wrong, and that sin has caused this mental issue for you. And that is such a challenge to break through the shame that comes with that. And so one of the things that I wanted to do is just allow this conversation to break free from that shame, to break people free from the stigma that sometimes church puts on people. Uh, not just saying wrong messages like that, but also just not talking about it. I think when church doesn't talk about it, that, that increases the stigma, that makes people feel like they can't share about their pain or their struggles either because it's just too bad or they're too broken. And that exacerbates the problem, that leads to more shame. And so I want Want to be part of a church, and I'm glad I get to be part of this church where we do talk about these issues. And I know the pandemic has opened the door to even have culture talking about it more, mm -hmm. but these issues existed before the pandemic. And if I look at pre-pandemic numbers of how many people struggle with these issues, it is a, a ginormous part of the population. Uh, looking at the numbers, any of these issues that you listed off, about pretty much everybody has struggled with them themselves or have a loved one that struggles with them. And so I really do value having a voice to be able to speak into uh, how to address mental health issues in the church. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you're here and, and so grateful for what God has called you specifically to within the context of this body and just your life. And specifically for our conversation today is we're, is we're gonna open up the first topic of our series and that is addiction. Now. This, this topic hits very close to home for me. And, and I'm sure, like you said, for, for many of us, um, my wife, Amanda, is a recovering alcoholic. Uh, this November, she will hit her 11 year mark of sobriety. And, and Amy, I'm really glad you mentioned how protective you are about, about mental issues and the people on that journey. Because um, I feel the same way about my wife. I'm so protective of, of her journey and her, and I've seen the tension that comes from the church um, and we were married 14 years ago, and in the first three years of our marriage, we battled through her addiction. And I, and I use that word battle very intentionally. Um, there were so many tense and just painful moments for both of us uh, in those first three years. And after that, I, I saw her commit to her sobriety and, and the struggle that came with that. But I wasn't prepared for any of it when we got married. Like, I didn't know how much of a process addiction and recovery is. And, and I was tossed into that and I wasn't ready for it, which made the first part of our marriage super challenging. Um, but I think what was even more challenging, and this connects so much with what you just said, um, and this is me just being transparent with everyone, was watching my, my wife go through what she was going through and me working in the job that I work in. Uh, being a pastor, as you're all well aware, uh, is a very public-facing job. And people know a lot about our lives. And with that, there's also certain unspoken things that pastors or their spouses just shouldn't be going through. Like, you shouldn't be struggling with those things if you have a relationship with Jesus. Um, and addiction to alcohol is definitely one of those taboo things. And, and I think for a while, we... I think we felt like it was something we needed to kind of keep quiet or out of the spotlight that comes with what I do. And, and we just, we didn't want to share with a bunch of people. Um, and I th some of that was probably overblown on our part. But, but there's also the reality, like, and I experienced this, of the, the sideways looks, the unintentional and sometimes intentional judgmental remarks, the gossip, and, and even the backstabbing that happened when people would use my wife's addiction against her when we'd 
finally feel safe or comfortable enough to let them into our, into our pain. So with all the stigmas about mental issues with, within the church, I can attest firsthand that there are reasons why people don't feel like church is the safest place to open up about what they're going through, which absolutely breaks my heart. Um, I will say, though, that most of the folks at Cornerstone have been incredible when we've talked about this or opened up about um, my wife's addiction, but, but our experience with professing Christians hasn't always been awesome, uh, which, is, which is why I'm beyond impressed by the bravery, courage, and desire to help other people um, that my wife is exhibiting by sharing her story with all of us today. Um, so here's my wife, Amanda. Hi, my name is Amanda, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I first realized that maybe I had a problem when um, I started to kind of uh, get in fights when I was drinking. Um, and that started in middle school, so I was kind of young. Uh, but it never got better. It kind of just slowly progressed um, into just more um, kind of bad behavior, um, feeling bad about myself, and so trying to cover those feelings with alcohol, um, feeling socially awkward, which is just who I am, um, and so covering that as well. Um, and um, it just started to get pretty bad. In high school, I had um, a, a long-term relationship, and that kind of uh, reflected my level of addiction um, in, in my life because I became codependent, and then when I wasn't with him, I would need to drink. Um, and then it slowly, you know, got to the point where I felt like you know, life isn't really that great. Um, I don't really have very much, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what the point is. Um, and so I was able to reach out uh, to my parents who were very supportive and loving, um, but I, I had to go to a rehab center, um, which was really hard um, because it helped me it, – it was difficult because it helped me, um, but um, – just tough to face the reality that I have a problem um, and it's not, I'm not normal, you know, normal society's definition of normal. Um, and so I thought, okay, great, I'll, you know, I'll go to meetings, I'll be sober, and I was able to find uh, some peace in that, but um, there was part of me that didn't think I had a problem. And so I kind of just played the game for a while, and then about six years after that, realized, uh, you know what? I'm older now, I'm more mature, I can handle it. Um, and so I relapsed, and it was really bad. Um, and this was when I was married, still married, uh, but to the same person, wonderful Steve. Um, but the relapse was uh, pretty eye-opening. Um, it was like twice as bad. So it's like I'd have to have twice as much and I can never have one drink. I had to drink until I couldn't uh, really comprehend. Um, it was a way to just disappear. And so uh, there was a point where we were on a family vacation and um, it was so bad that, you know, I was causing trouble on our family vacation. And I remember the next day I had woken up and was apologizing to Steve because um, I knew that the way I acted was really negative and uh, kind of scary. And uh, what he said was, you know, I understand you're sorry, but and I love you, but I, I know it's not you when you're drinking. And I think that was kind of like the turning point that I had someone who loved me and uh, realized that um, I needed to stop what I was doing. So I, uh, I stopped. I stopped that, uh, that day on our family vacation, and I've been sober for, uh, it will be 11 years in November. And um, it was 
it was tough. You know, I don't feel like I'm part of the norm. Um, I don't feel like people accept me easily and people are intimidated when I say, hi, my name is Amanda and I'm an alcoholic. Um, but that's who I am. And uh, I think that it's important to embrace that because uh, that's the only way I can go day to day and realize I'll be okay. Um, of course, only way I made it is realizing I had to let go and let God. Um, and having that relationship with God in my life is really kind of like what keeps me going, is knowing He's in control and I'm not in control. And He loves me and He knows that I, I'll make mistakes, but He's there for me. And um, so that's what has kept me kept me going. So my name's Amanda and I'm an alcoholic and I'm proud of who I am and thankful for my life. I am just so grateful for Amanda's story, for her sharing, and I know it takes a lot of courage to be able to share uh, such truths with people and not knowing, as you mentioned earlier, Steve, not knowing exactly how people are going to receive that truth. So thank you, Amanda, for sharing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not even, it's not knowing how people are going to receive it and not even knowing who she's sharing it with necessarily, and I, I'm just so proud of, of Amanda, um, but as she shared her story, I, I couldn't help but go back to those first few years of our marriage when she was drinking and we had all those heated arguments, screaming at the top of our lungs at one another, saying things we couldn't ever take back. Um, I think of the pain I felt, but also, and I don't want to, I don't, I don't want anyone to miss this, the pain that I inflicted. Um, I didn't have an understanding of what Amanda was going through. Like I said, I was just thrown into it. I didn't, I didn't know. And I know with that, there were many moments where I did way more harm than good being dismissive and just telling her to knock it off, just quit drinking, like uh, being confrontational and angry and selfish. D th th none of those things helped us or helped her at all. And there were some deep wounds that I know I created um, during that first part of our marriage, um, which still pains me in so many ways. And, you know, we've, we've walked through that and processed that. And I think even though there's that very real pain, we also, we also feel like we're on the other side of it. Not that you ever arrive, like recovery is a consistent ongoing process for Amanda, but I'm so grateful for the people in our life who, who fully support her in her recovery. Both of our parents, my mom, every, every November still sends my wife a uh, sobriety chip and it means the world to her, uh, to Amanda. We have friends who have unconditionally loved us through this entire process. Um, friends who saw us both at our very worst and helped us get to our best. And, and ultimately, and I know this sounds like something I'm supposed to say as a, as a pastor, um, but without the enduring and persistent grace of Jesus in our lives, I, I don't think we would have made it. Um, he's been our rock with this and every other struggle that we've, we've had in our marriage. And I'm really glad that we had people, some of those people that I listed in our lives, pushing us toward Jesus. It was so, it was so important. Yeah, I love hearing that. Um... That's community, Christian community done well, which is nice. Uh, I also love that Amanda is at a place where she can celebrate and you all are celebrating yeah. her recovery. Yeah. Uh, but I also know that not everybody who's listening is there right now. And so I really do wanna just address that for another moment. I know you mentioned that, mm -hmm. but, um, but I wanna address that just to let anybody know wherever you're at on that journey, even if you haven't admitted yet that it's a problem, that you have a problem, that it's okay. It's okay for you to be where you are at because denial sometimes is a lot easier to stay in when you feel hopeless for change or when you have a struggle thinking that you will get the support that you need. And so I want you to know that it is okay wherever you're at, even if you haven't started the recovery process, it's okay to be where you're at, but also know that we would love for you to be able to have that strength to push forward and break free from it because no matter what, the very first step, admitting that you have a problem, takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. and seeking out help is so hard to do. So please, please, please do that. Yeah, I think, I think you, you said a word right there that is so important. You said courage. And I think regardless of where you're at on your journey in recovery or um, the steps that you've taken, it takes so much courage. And I think that's why I'm so proud of Amanda and why she's one of my heroes. Her, her bravery, her courage, her resilience is inspiring. And 
I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to watch her live in that freedom. And I even love how she, she opened her story. Um, she said, hi, my name is Amanda. And that's no coincidence that, I mean, it sounds like, oh, it's, of course that's how she's gonna introduce herself. But that's very intentional the way she said that. Um, because one, and, and here's why. One of, my, one of my favorite things about folks who have, have used the 12 steps through AANA or any of the other groups that utilize the 12 steps is how they begin. Um, it's a completely diverse group of people that get together and then each person introduces themselves, they say their name, and then they state their struggle. Hi, my name is John and I'm an alcoholic. And then the rest of the group would say, hi, John. I think just kind of as a side note, that's such a great model for being the church and probably how we should start every gathering we have. Hi, my name is Steve and I'm a sinner. Um, and you all would say, hi, Steve. Uh, I, I, I just, I think there's, there's so much to that uh, connection and, and inclusivity that that's created in those in those moments. Yeah, I agree, and I want to also stress because I know people that are sitting in shame, mm -hmm. whether about the addictions or any kind of mental health issues that they might be struggling with, when they hear sermons, mm -hmm. they're sitting, listening, thinking that sermon's for everybody else, right? Those are for the good people around me and not me, hmm. right? I'm not good enough, I can't, this is not talking to me, my heart, my soul. And so I just really wanna say, if that's you right now, this message is for you, that, that you are right along with us because we are all broken, we all have issues, we're all struggling, we're all in need of Jesus. And so no matter again, if that's you thinking you're not good enough, this message is not for you, Please, this message is for you. You are good enough. We are all broken and we're all in need of Jesus. Yeah, that's so, I think of when Paul writes about sinners and he says, I'm the worst. Mm -hmm. Like the, one of the guys who wrote most of our New Testament mm -hmm. said, I'm of whom, like sinners of whom I'm the worst. Like mm -hmm. there's some, some profound things there. And I think it, we get to connect with one another when we realize that we don't all have it together, which I think the church for a long time has been a place where you're supposed to have it together. Um, and I love what you're saying. It's like, it's okay to, to not be okay. It's okay to struggle. Um, and, and, and I think that's why I love what recovery groups do because what these groups do when they're, when they're introducing themselves and responding, it's, it's saying to those, that person that's introducing themselves, I see you, I can, I can relate with you, I know you, and, and I'm like you. You're accepted here. There's, there's purpose in, in their gatherings. And when you throw the foundation of Jesus in a group like that, that's fellowship. We've talked so much at this church about, about fellowship and koinonia and what it means to, to, to be the church that Jesus wants us to be. And, and that's what I hope we create and that's what recovery groups do. Um, people who from, from the outside look completely different from one another but, but have the same brokenness on the inside, um, messy, damaged, painful situations that they're, they're processing and going through. And then they gather together with a common purpose. And I think our gatherings as the church need to communi communicate the exact same thing. And I hope and pray and like if I can, this is going to sound weird, but if I can like demand anything of our church, it would be that this is a safe place for people. It has to be. If we, if we ever elevate ourselves above someone who is struggling, we've completely missed Jesus. We've missed him entirely. Okay, like I said, that's a side note. Back, back to the topic at hand. Amy, from, from what I've read and understand, um, addiction typically comes about when someone uses a substance to feel better or make pain go away or deal with some form of trauma. Would you say that that understanding is accurate? And if so, or if not, like what would you add or what would you say? Sure. Um to understand why people become addicted to things, uh, it, it's it's complicated, right? Like it, it's just all that that you mentioned and and more, uh, and so there's certainly a genetic component. There is this part of. Uh, a, part of people, and maybe about half, this might explain about half of addictions, that end up having a propensity. That doesn't mean that they are going to become an addict, but that biologically they're more predisposed, that they're more likely to become an addict. So there's certainly a genetic component, but even with that being said, there's environmental factors that really come into play here. And some of those environmental factors can even protect against addictions, where if you grow up in a loving home and with supportive parents and a great relationship with them uh, and have good experiences for most of your life and, and a healthy support system, chances are you're not gonna become an addict. But 
even without the ge genetic predisposition, people who experience pain, abuse, trauma, those people are more likely and more inclined to turn to substances and end up developing a problem with the, the use of them. And oftentimes that's to numb the pain. Uh, it doesn't necessarily even have to be traumatic experiences or abuse or neglect in their life. Uh, it could just be troubling relationships or hard situations that they're, they don't have enough resiliency to bounce back from. Or it could just be ongoing challenges that they're medicating themselves. It's almost like self-medicating uh, with substances. And so certainly there's a numbing of a pain or a self-medication component, component as well. And we see that across the board with all kinds of addictions, not just substances, but things like pornography, things like uh, sugar, even caffeine, uh, and even video game use and screen time. And uh, I mean, the list goes on. Yeah, not... I think it's so important. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just mm -hmm. think it's so important what you just said, that we have to recognize that addiction comes in so many forms. Um, and, and what you're doing is helping us understand why that happens, but to not just, like my brain automatically goes to alcoholism because that's my experience. Um, but I love that you broadened it and help us understand that there's addiction is a, is a huge topic that takes on many forms in people's lives, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it goes, there's so many different things. Um, and, and often what we see in common with all of those things is something, there's something called a dopamine effect. Uh, so dopamine, if you just simply, it's a neurotransmitter in the brain, but if you simply wanna think of it as a chemical in the brain that makes you feel good, then that's something that can help you understand this process that happens. That when you end up having something like a bunch of likes on Facebook or a bunch of followers on Instagram or that win on online gambling or a video game. Like it just gives you that high just like a substance would, right? Or just like that sexual release would, right? Like it gives you this pleasurable euphoric experience and that's called the dopamine effect. And what happens though, unfortunately, is once you experience that, you want more of it. Right? You want to be able to experience that again. And so people will turn to the, either the same thing or sometimes it requires more of that same thing to get that pleasurable experience again. And so they continue to do more of it and then they do more of it, just seeking out that pleasure. But unfortunately what happens is that they regret the time or the, time, the amount of money maybe they spend or the actions that they did um, or they regret some of the things they do when they were high on that substance or, and that regret unfortunately leads to shame, which then unfortunately leads them to often use the substance or that behavior again and helping themselves feel better. They've now entered into what we call a cycle of shame. Mm. They just keep repeating that cycle and unfortunately that's one of the things that really leads to addiction. And so kind of in summary of all of this, you asked me like what the causes oh, yeah. are. Just in summary, I would say certainly a genetic component. There is absolutely environmental factors at play. There's pleasure seeking uh, behaviors that lead to addiction. And there's also um, you know, forms of self-medication. And those are just a few of the big things. Wow. So that's, those are like the general things that you would say, but there's, there's way more than that. So good, I'm, I'm learning so much from you today. Um, and I'm sure we all are. I think one of the things, Amy, that would be so helpful for folks today would be to help someone or provide space for someone who's struggling with an addiction to, to figure out, like, where do I go next? Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say to someone who's trying to break free from addiction right now? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I would say that, and even thinking about some of these more what we call acceptable addictions, um, I would say you've really got to be honest and real and admit that there's a problem. And that's always the first thing. That's why, you know, in recovery programs, that's the very first thing other than your name that you say, right? right? My name's Amy, I'm an addict, right? Like, that's the first thing you say is that you admit that you have a problem. And when you do that, and I mentioned before, it's super hard because it's hard to feel like you can change, right? When you're stuck in addiction, it's hard to have that hope. And so admitting that you're, you have a problem is super challenging. But once you can do that, I want you to know that there are options, right? Depending on what you are addicted to, there's rehab, there's tons of support groups available. Uh, certainly there's therapy available or lay counseling. And uh, the benefit there is that you can have that support that can break free from the shame, which is super important. Uh, and then there's also something that I wanna address 
even if you're not quite ready or at that place where you want to get help, you can start making choices that are healthier choices of how to feel good or feel better than the shame-inducing addictive behavior that you have. Now, I am not condoning just replacing one addiction with another. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that instead of turning to that, that substance or that behavior or picking up your phone, try to figure out how you can help yourself feel better, maybe even seeking out that social support right now or going for a walk or just focusing on self-care that can help you reconcile that addictive behavior and start letting you see that there's ways that you can break free from it. And breaking free really does require uh, eliminating that shame, mm. right? That shame is keeps us in that and perpetuates that problem and keeps us in that shame cycle. And so as much as you can, this is what I would say, be known, open up, Right? Even if you don't want to show that you have a problem, at least open up that you maybe think that you might or that you have a hard time saying no to certain behaviors or substances. I think just opening up and being known mm -hmm. is one of the greatest gifts that you can give to yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. I hope anyone that's struggling right now is taking her word seriously. That's, I mean, expert advice for someone who's, who's struggling right now. So um, I, also, I also love that you mentioned recovery again. Because there's I, this is something I've studied a bunch as my wife's gone through her process, but there's something that is that is so central to the Christian faith that folks in recovery I think have figured out better than most, and um, and it's it's the freedom and power that comes from surrender, and the the whole the whole twelve step program which is followed by millions of recovering addicts across the world um, because of a, a bunch of different reasons, but one of the main reasons is this idea of of surrender. Surrendering your will. Uh, I've learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous, none of the 12 steps say anything, which this was like mind-blowing. None of them say anything about trying really hard to not drink anymore or even mention deciding not to drink. Um, to me, those would be like, oh, that's what you should do. Um, again, which is why it wasn't helpful for my wife as she was going through uh, her recovery. But the, the, most, the most powerful tool against one of the most powerful addictions in the world never once asks people to stop doing what what is destroying their lives. Instead, its followers make a choice, and this is step three, to turn or surrender their will and their lives over to God. Surrender, which we, we often associate defeat. Like if someone surrenders, they're giving up, right? It actually turns out to be the only way to victory, which, which is so mind-blowing to me. And, and, and if we can wrap our, our brains around that today, that surrender is the only way to victory, it's such a profound thought that for many of us who consider ourselves followers of Jesus, um, we've we've kind of jumped to this place that following Jesus is about do this and don't do that. Like try really hard to not do this and try really hard to do this. Um, but it, that's not what it is. And Jesus makes this clear. It's about surrendering your heart to him and not whatever that other thing is. Uh, I mean, just, oh, geez, I'm throwing my computer around. I'm so excited about this. Just listen to some of the things that Jesus says. Um, Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And then later, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it, to die, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. And then one of my favorite things that Jesus ever said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You know, all of these statements had to do with surrender. It's, it's foundational to the, to the Christian faith. And I've seen folks that are going through the 12 steps and that are in recovery, just work those steps to a, to a T. And so much of it is just based around this concept of surrender and, and it's, it's life-giving. Um, I have a friend who, who's worked the 12 steps for addiction and he's battled um, some addictions in the past. And he was struggling a few weeks back with someone at work and he just said, hey, Steve, I, I need some advice. And I didn't have any like earth-shattering advice to give him, but I, I just said hey, I think you're kind of being consumed by this thing at work. Why don't you just try working the 12 steps for that thing too? And, and he did, and he came back to me a few weeks later. He's like, oh my gosh. Like, it worked so well, but it wasn't like the, the trick worked. It was, I surrendered that thing, and then I got to process the rest of it with some people around me. And, and I was just, it was just really cool to see those uh, 12 steps work in a different setting as well. And that's why I think there's so much beauty in, in, in those things because they lead to surrendering your will. You know, thy will be done, not my will be done. 
And, and that's what leads us to, to victory. And it's been leading people to victory for years and years and years. So. Yeah, I, I love the 12 steps for so many different reasons. Um, one of them, just even what you mentioned, that they can be used beyond just the recovery process right. of that addiction. Right? They can be used in lots of different ways um, to be able to, any struggle or challenge that you have, that is certainly something that you can turn to. Um, I also, one of the other things I love about 12 step programs, and you've addressed this already, but want to reiterate, that um, that you're never done, hmm. right? You are never done on that healing journey. Even if you've had way more years of sobriety than you even are alive, right? right? We're alive before you're drinking um, or whatever substance, that, that you're always going to need support. You always need um, to acknowledge that this is something that you that are struggling mm -hmm. with. Um, and again, going back to we're all a work in progress. Yeah. And I hold on to that for everybody every single person, because again, we all have issues, and it makes the verse of Philippians 1, 6 so much mm. more true and so much more hopeful to me that, that we're all, again, that work in progress and that he who began that good work in you will see it through to the completion of Jesus Christ, right? To yeah. that day that we're reunited with Jesus. Yeah. And to me, that gives me permission to never have it right. Amen, amen. Yeah, I, I hope and pray that we can be a people that that does not stigmatize any of the things that we'll be talking about throughout this series, including addiction, that we can that we can walk through it well with people. And I hope we're focused on helping people heal and find victory and, and create a safe place for them um, so that we can see the thing that you just mentioned in Philippians 1.6, that God that began a good work, we'll, we'll see it through to completion. So um, as I say that, Amy, I want to make sure that we're, we're also support to anyone who has a loved one that's struggling with addiction. So I have two questions for you. Um, the first, what would you say to someone who's living with or connected to someone who's battling an addiction? Yeah, um, well, I've got to say, honestly, that I know the challenge. Uh, and I know how challenging that is professionally as well. But I got to tell you, honestly, I know it personally. I have loved ones right now that are struggling with addictions and how to break free from them. Uh, and so I know how helpless it can feel to watch your loved ones and how you see them in their pain and that brokenness, and you want to be able to step in and intervene and can't. You don't know what to do, don't know what to say, uh, and that it even hurts the relationship there. And so I know that pain, and I know how hard it is sometimes to even have the hope that things can change. Uh, and I also know how easy it is to remain in that denial, not only maybe of the problem, but denial minimizing the impact of the, the abuse uh, to uh, substances or um, whatever addictive behaviors they have. It's so damaging. And I know, I know that. And I know how easy it is to get angry, super angry at them like you were saying about your wife, about why can't you just stop? Why can't you just change? It's super easy to switch into that judgmental and that anger is that, that response to our helplessness. And so that helplessness, that hopelessness that we feel, that is our challenge right now. And I, I understand that. And so I know where you're at. Yeah, yeah, that's so, so true. I think things can appear to be so bleak and hopeless in those moments. So when you're when you're counseling someone in this area, what what advice or instruction do you give to that person? Sure, sure. If they're a Christian, I tell them to pray about it. So I'll tell you all to pray for it, and not in this trite way of like, oh, pray and everything's going to get better. <laughs> I hate when people say that kind of prayer. Um, but what I mean by that is to pray about it. Is it's really a prayer for you. That, that you can release your loved one into the care of God because it is not your job to be that person's savior. Yeah. It is not your job to make the change come about in their life, right? Your job is to just be who you are, who God created you to be. And be, by praying for them, it's like you can release that desire for changing them into God's hands because God is the only one that can intervene there. You can't. And so what I want you to do is pray and that prayer is for you to be able to release your loved one into the care of God. And that goes along with the next thing that I would tell you is that you've got to have really good boundaries right now. You've got to acknowledge what 
it, uh, it's just a hard thing to be facing right now of how much you love your loved one and how much that loving them can feel like you're enabling that addiction or that behavior. And it's a fine line to walk sometimes. And so given that, and given how hard that can be, I would challenge you or I'd ask you or just give you the permission to seek out support. Right, seek out your own support. That's why Al-Anon, Alateen, that's why some support groups are made specifically for people in your shoes. And so seek out that support so that you don't lose yourself, right? Because that's another thing that I would tell you to do is to focus on your self-care and focus on the things that bring you joy and hope and optimism. So do your hobbies that you love. Be in relationship with people that bring you joy. Uh, go for exercise and walks and just commune in nature or with God or however you get filled up. Continue to do that. And the last thing I'd encourage you to do is to think of information as power. Uh, because the more you can know about the addiction that your loved one has, the more it can help you understand it, help you understand what they're going through, but also, also opens the door that you might know what to say or where to point them if they do seek out help mm -hmm. and if they do say that they want to start the process of recovery. So information is power mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, th yeah, thank you. I think the, the tension that you brought up is something I've experienced and so real, and I appreciate you acknowledging that and helping people walk through that. Um, well, before we, we close our, our part in this conversation about ad addiction, um, I just want to remind everyone and be very clear that this is intended to be the beginning of the conversation. Again, we hope and pray that if you or someone you love is struggling with addiction, that we can be a resource to you, this time that we've spent together is not intended to be the solution. So we're just hoping to uh, hoping to open the door. Um, Amy, any any thoughts you want to add before we we wrap up? Our yeah, there's a couple things that I'd love to add. Um, one is that there is a resource list that we put together and resources available to you on your screen probably right now mm -hmm. as I'm speaking. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing that I really want to stress the importance of is that. Man, if somebody comes and opens up to you, your job is to listen and love. Listen and love. And I cannot say that enough because the shame people feel perpetuates the problem. And if you give platitudes or trade advice or Bible thumping or using scripture erroneously to foster shame, mm -hmm then man, that's gonna cause more harm than good. And so as a Christ follower, I would ask you to follow Christ and his unconditional love for us, no matter where we're at, is what was so healing for us as a Christian, but also that is what's going to help heal people from the shame of mental illness, the shame of the addictive, the addictive behaviors where they're at right now. And so what I really want to stress is when people open up, listen mm -hmm. and love and offer God's love and God's grace to them. Yeah. yeah. Well, Amy, thank you so much for, for being here and, and teaching us and leading us. I'm so, so glad that you're part of this fellowship and you have this responsibility that God's placed on you to, to lead us and guide us and lead folks through um, all these things that we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. So I want to, I want to ask you to pray for us, if that's okay, in just a moment. But before I do, I want to just mention one more thing. Um, earlier, I talked about my wife and, and, and watching her go through her recovery and just how much she strengthens and, and um, is an example to me about what her faith looks like. And, and so much of that is, and we talk about this a lot at home, is, is that concept of surrender that I brought up earlier. And I just want to leave us with this. One of my, one of my favor, favorite authors writes, there is no way for a human being to come to God that does not involve surrender. And Jesus understood that if you want to experience victory, you must start in surrender. Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. That root word for the, the, the word delivered in the Greek means to give to, into the hands of or surrender over. Um, Jesus was surrendered over to death for our sins, for our victory. He understood surrender. So whether you're struggling with an addiction or not, this is something that we can all learn from Jesus and, and people like my wife. And usually those aren't comfortable. It's not comfortable to surrender. 
But that's when we have to decide and ask ourselves, will I surrender when surrender means doing something uncomfortable? By the way, if, if it's comfortable, it's probably not surrender. Um, it can be painful. But the amazing part about surrender is that through Jesus, God knows the pain of surrender. If you look back in, in Scripture and we read the Gospels and Jesus' story, we see that before he was arrested and, and eventually crucified, he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed, Take this cup from me. Take it. But not my will, God. Yours be done. In this moment, Jesus surrendered. And just as surrender led to resurrection for Jesus, so it does for his followers. So before Amy prays, let me leave you with this thought, and I hope you'll carry it with you and process and work through it. The cost of surrendering to Jesus is great. The cost of not surrendering to him is greater. Amy, will you pray? Absolutely. God, thank you so much for this time. I thank you for the ability to be part of the conversation to reduce the shame and stigma about addictions or mental illness as, as a whole. Uh, Lord, I am so thankful for people like Amanda sharing their stories and people like Steve opening up about the pain they've experienced to be able to be very real and authentic about the life transformation that can and could happen um, when you can admit to that powerlessness over whatever substance you're addicted to and the pain of, um, of what you've been going through and to be able to surrender that to you. And Lord, so I pray for everybody right now who is having any kind of a struggle, whether it be an addictive behavior or substance or uh, some other struggle right now, that they can turn to you right now and just lay down that, that item before you and ask for help. And Lord, I pray that we can be a people that, that if they opened up to us, that we can receive that well. And we can honor that gift of their sharing as a sacred gift that it is, that it's being real and authentic and vulnerable in front of you. And so Lord, I pray that you will allow us to be Christ-like people, that we can honor people's stories wherever they're at and love them and guide them to you and let them surrender and be part of that process if they're willing to let us be. So Lord, thank you for this time to be able to talk about this. I pray that you'll be working in our hearts to bring us closer to you each day. And I know a lot of that is the shame that needs to be removed so that we can feel your love and that we can feel accepted by you and feel God, your forgiveness and grace. And so Lord, I pray that every person struggling right now will feel that. And I pray that we'll be the people that can show that as well. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.